Let's pray together again. Father, thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit and the gift of the Word of God. May it be proclaimed with great power and great clarity, not because of anything else, but because of the potency of the Word of God. And I'm coming to you from this text with this title, Ready or Not. The readiness to fight is essential for us to acquire the victory that God has promised. And therefore, suiting up, meaning putting on the full armor of God, and praying is necessary for us. And in not doing so, the victory will be elusive. How many of us want to be victorious this morning? Amen. I remember three fights I've had in high school. I won one. The other was a draw. And the other one, I was mangled across the room with a chair around my neck. It was quite a sight to behold. I'll tell you about the one that I won. <laughs> I remember the guy's name very distinctly. His name was Kajabi Dawes. We were in chemistry class. And I was sitting there, and, uh, and, and he was almost, as it were, taunting me. And I gave a surprise blow. <laughs> and he was quite surprised because he wasn't expecting it. It wasn't the cheap shot. It was a direct shot right in the kisser. And the fight ensued. And I won. And I can tell you the story today that Kajavi and I are still good friends after this. Can I tell you about the one that I lost? <laughs> the one that I lost was against Wendell Alexander. I remember their names. <laughs> Wendell had been a transfer from ninth grade achievement test. And, and what that was, was in Jamaica, we though had those of us who took the common entrance exam, and then we went into one of the traditional high schools. Kind of an elitist kind of a mentality. Yes. <laughs> and then you had those who came in with the ninth grade achievement test. They got a second chance to come amongst us. And Wendell was one of those transfers, you know, um, he didn't get it the first time. And uh, he was transferred and he was actually a part of the, um, the track team. I was strawny then. And Wendell was quite muscular. And I was insisting that he did not have the... Uh, acumen, per se, to be a part of this establishment. <laughs> and I can tell you what happened after that. He certainly made it known that he was among the ranks by taking me out. And I remember when I came to, there was a chair around my neck, and I had no victory to celebrate. And in our life, and, in, and on this journey that we're on, Christ has provided victory for us. But in order for us to take a hold of this victory, we must ask ourselves this one question. Am I ready or am I not ready? 
Before I continue with the sermon this morning, I want us to look at where we have been over the past few weeks. We have talked about the mystery of two groups, the Gentiles, the us's. You know, and those were the us's who passed the first time. And there were the them's, the you's, who came in afterwards. And because of in that kind of uh, situation, there was the need for, for unity within the school. And so it is the need for unity within the church of the living God. And somebody ought to shout amen on that. There is need for unity among the people of God. And so the two groups, the Jews and the Gentiles, were brought together in this great mystery that we cannot fully understand, wrought by the blood of Jesus Christ. This mystery that we will never fully understand on this side of earth. But when we get to heaven, this great mystery will unfold in its fullness. We have seen in the first half, we have talked about the necessity of doctrine, the necessity for teaching. And might I add it today, within our present day context, we so do not like teaching. We don't like instructions because we have come to a place where we can find anything on the internet. But I might, might I say to you, this that is not teaching, but that is information. Teaching comes in that exchange of ideas, in that exchange where one instructs the other and the other follows upon that instruction. And so I say to us, it is important for us to understand the doctrines of God, the doctrines of the church, because it is necessary for us because without this teaching, we will certainly not be able to live out the second half of the book of Ephesians that involves how, the ethics, the ethos of how we are to live out what we have been taught. A familiar passage in Ephesians that reminds us of this great truth. We are his workmanship. Amen, somebody. Look to your neighbor and say, I am his workmanship. In the book of Ephesians, beginning at chapter 5, and I'm going to take, take off from there, we see that Paul now instructs the believer on how to live in public life. And we don't want to live right sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes we just don't want to live right. Sometimes we want to do what we feel like doing. But the scripture is very clear. We ought to live in accordance to the truth of God. And Paul recommends a couple of things. That husbands ought to love their wives. And wives ought to respect their husbands. And children ought to obey their masters. Children ought to obey their parents. And employees have to obey employers. Or within the text it said slaves. And in these three very important arena, the thing that we understand that within that culture, within that context, women were property, children were property. And so they, in, that, in those relationships, they had to adhere to whatever the father said, whatever the head of the household said. And so when we talk about getting married for love, in that context, that was not the case. You, we people married because the father made an arrangement with someone to bolster his position within the community. 
And these arrangements were made without even asking the young lady, is he tall enough? <laughs> anyway, y'all. <laughs> is he smart enough? But all of this was based upon not the desire of the child, but rather on what the parents said. And because the wife was property, she had no say. And so in this great reversal, Paul says that husbands ought to love their wives. Now, if on my wedding night I'm meeting my wife for the first time, you see, I, you know, look, y'all know what I'm going to say, right? I got a hot wife, so it don't really matter. <laughs> Uh, yes. You know, if, if I saw her for the first time when we were getting married, I'd be happy. Uh, there was a guy in, in the scriptures that wasn't so lucky. He got the ugly one. <laughs> and then he had to work seven more years to get the pretty one. <laughs> yeah, God has so blessed me. Uh, you know, no, it, no, I didn't get the ugly one. <laughs> and you're going to say, well, Pastor Mark, no one is ugly. Well, only a mother can say that. <laughs> All right, okay, let's, let, let's uh, yeah, we're working with it. And as I said, because wives were property, children were also property. Can you imagine living in such an environment? And so when the scripture says, train up a child, it is not saying train them up so that he or she can do your bidding. It is saying train them up so he or she can do the work of God. Amen, somebody. work between the slave and the owner the owner had complete control and in, and in our modern day context that is not so very different you see one of the things that they're using today is they're talking about downsizing right sizing and and many are living in fear because they, we are thinking that we might not have a job tomorrow because of all of this. And many rule with fear rather than with respect and love. Within that context, the slave had no legal prerogatives. The owner had no obligation to reimburse the slave for his work. Within our modern day context, they would they pay as little as they possibly can and give you the work for four people. Ready or not. And so this idea of husbands loving their wives and, and fathers were instructed not to provoke their children to anger, and owners were instructed to perceive their role as employees as, as a service to them and recognizing that they too are children of God. In other words, Paul was suggesting a redistribution of power. And so we come to the text that Emmanuel read so eloquently. Thank you, Emmanuel. And the text opens and says this. You want to read it again for me? Let's go to the book of Ephesians chapter 6.
And this is what it says. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the scheme of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, and against cosmic forces over this present darkness. And in these closing statements, Paul kind of hearkens back to, the, to chapter 1 where he talks about that God has blessed us in the heavenlies with all the spiritual blessings. So now he moves back to this idea, but then he brings about something that is important for the church to understand. The church must understand that we are at war. Let me say that again. We are at war. And if we are naive to think that we are not fighting an enemy who has been doing this for centuries, then we have a problem. This war that we're fighting, it is not against flesh and blood. This war that we're fighting is not whether we sing from the hymn book or whether we sing contemporary songs. This war is not whether we have cheers or pews or whether we have black or whether we have green. This war is not about the preferences that we have within the body of Christ as far as how we celebrate the very presence of God in this place. That is not the fight that we fight. We are not fighting a battle based upon human ideas, but we are fighting a battle against an enemy, an enemy who has been doing this for centuries, an enemy who is powerful, an enemy who is unrelenting, and an enemy whose only plan is to destroy what the Spirit of God it desires to do within the life of his people and in the life of the church. That is what we are fighting against. We are not fighting against a political system that has taken on attributes of darkness. We are fighting an enemy that is dark in and of himself because this thing that we must know that power is neutral. But how we use it, how it how we use power determines whether it is light or darkness. And the enemy has chosen to use power to destroy. So how then do we deal with this battle that we are in? Do we bury our heads in the sand and pretend that it no longer, that it does not exist? Or that was for another time and another space? Absolutely not. We are at war, so we do this. We suit up. And listen to what the text says. It says, now, therefore. Now, I love that word, therefore, in the text, because it says all of the stuff that we have discussed are important. But here is the kicker. Here is the one that you and I must pay close attention to. Therefore, glory to God, put on the full armor of God. Put it on so that when the day of evil comes, what will happen? You might be able to stand to stand your ground after you have done all to stand stand come on somebody after you have done everything possible to stand up 
Sometimes you're going to have to go and lean up against something to hold you up because of the onslaught of the enemy. So after you have done all to stand, no matter what is happening, stand therefore. Come on, we're going to suit up this morning. We're going to put on some things that is necessary to necessitate the win and the constant victory that we need as the people of God. And the text goes on to say, therefore, take on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and your shoes, and for the feet, having put on the readiness of the gospel of peace, and in all circumstances, it didn't say some, in all circumstances, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith by with, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit. Now, I am not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about the armor. Because my, the primary focus is on our readiness. We cannot just put on some pieces of the armor. May I ask a question? If you showed up here with only some pieces of clothing on, wouldn't that, that would be a problem, wouldn't it? <laughs> just in our regular everyday life, if we leave off something, it would be a problem. But when it comes on to fighting an enemy that is seeking to destroy us, we do not put on the full armor of God. We leave something out. We do not pick up the armor. So point one, we leave something out. Point two, we don't put it on at all. But how can we gain the victory in that particular situation? Because the enemy is prepared. Are you prepared? Am I prepared? Brothers and sisters, this fight that we are in is a real fight. I want to say it again, it's a real fight. Are you ready for it? Do I need to go back up there? I have to obey. It's a real fight. Many are losing. Because we're not holding each other accountable. If you got a friend who is a believer who does not pick up his or her sword. And you don't say, hey, you got a problem. You're an enabler. And the victory that we need all around us is what? is denied because we are not suited up properly. I didn't, I don't like losing. When I lost those fights, they affected me. You know, um, the very fact that I can talk about it is, might, might seem to be hilarious, but you know, um, I, I remember each and every one of them because they all had an impact on my life. How many fights are you losing at home, 
at school, at work? How many fights are we losing at church? Wherever we go, how many fights are we losing? Brothers and sisters, this is not the kind of message that will get us into a euphoric state. This is a more reflective sermon. Because I believe it is necessary for us to embrace what God desires to do as he works in us. I want you to think of a number between one and five, five being the highest. And we're going to come back to this thought towards the end of the sermon. What is your level of readiness in this fight on a scale of one to five? Just let that stay there. What is the level of readiness. And towards the end of the sermon, we're going to revisit that thought because I believe it is necessary for us to do so. And finally, not only are we to suit up with the whole armor of God, we ought to pray up I have a question for us, church. Are we a praying people? Are we a praying people? We can talk about all the things that are not to our particular preference. We can talk about a lot of those things. But are we prayed up? You see, we have abandoned the gear, the armor. And so victory is elusive. But even more, what is even more crazy, we have abandoned prayer. Are we truly praying for one another? Or are we just simply praying, oh God, bless me and my family? Are we praying for our pastor that God will grant him the wisdom to lead us? Wives, are you praying for your husband? that God will help him to love you like Christ loves the church. Husbands, are you praying for your wives to, so that she might be able to walk with that level of respect? Children, are you praying for your parents, even those who have left you? You see, we want to talk about political issues. We want to talk about all things that, that is happening everywhere else. But we don't want to be able to move into the arenas where when that change takes place, it will impact the world. That's where the change truly happens. The change happens within us. It happens within our homes. And so if we then, as the people of God, are not praying up in our homes, then we have no victory. Our victory is shallow and it is useless. 
And there's nothing that we can go back to. Because the thing that I will say to us, that the enemy has launched all-out war upon the people of God. And the people of God are not prepared for the onslaught because we are not armored up. We are not prayed up. And we are asking God, God, when will we have the victory? And God is saying, put on the whole armor so that you might be able to stand. The truth of the matter is, the enemy is going to come, and he's going to come hard. He will have no mercy on you. He will have no mercy on me. He will have no mercy on us. But we go through this all day long without the idea that we need to suit up. Prayer is essential for this victory. And I want to challenge you again. Think of a number. One through five. Five being the highest. What is your commitment to personal prayer? Don't roll up in here trying to tell us that you know how to pray when you can't even pray at home. Just don't do it. Because it's empty. And we see that because victory has eluded us. Would you stand? There's a lot more that I could actually say, but I, I believe where we are, we need to reflect. We need to have a real conversation with ourselves. I needed to find somebody beside you and though that exercise that we talked about earlier what is the level of your readiness could you turn around and tell that person that number and I please we, you're in the house of God no, I'm not, I, I ain't playing alright turn around and tell the person the number Now the next number is the number of how ready we are in prayer. Turn around and tell that person the number. And if everyone has a number above three, I am going to say collectively that may be a fabrication. And I'm going to tell you why I feel so that that is a fabrication if we were praying as we ought to we would see the kingdom of hell being rolled back if that were correct we would see drug dealers whoremongers liars and thieves come to know Jesus Christ we will see the sick and the afflicted healed by the power of Jesus Christ if that number were correct we would see men women boys and girls fall before God in repentance saying I give myself to you God if that number were 
indeed correct. We will have no empty pews. Oh, Jesus. If that number were correct, we would have no budgetary issues. Oh, yeah. If that number were correct, our homes would be a whole lot brighter. You would be a whole lot nicer. I would be a whole lot nicer if that number were correct because there's no way how to be armored up, how to be sprayed up and the kingdom of hell is not pushed back to the point where they would say there's a bunch of crazy people praying to their God over at Metropolitan Baptist Church. This world would know that there is a people of God who are ready. And so I ask us this question, are you ready or are you not? I ask the question again, and I solicit a response that is more accurate to the state of our, our lives and our condition. I ask the question again, between one and five, in terms of our readiness for battle, what is that number? Now, don't tell your neighbor. Tell Jesus. And finally, in terms of prayer, what is that number? Kiani. And I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves when oceans rise my soul not give a complete altar call. Could you dim the lights a little bit? And we are going to kneel right where we are. If you can't kneel, sit. We are going to call upon God with one voice this morning. We are going to pray. Because there are some things around us that ought to change that is not going to happen without us praying. Keep on singing, baby. No, this is not silent prayer. Come on and open up your mouth and begin to cry out to God. Keep my 
As we get ready to close this series and this message, I feel just in my spirit that maybe there are folks who say, you know what, I might not be where I need to be, but I want to get ready. I want to be ready for the enemy as he comes. If that's you, the, the Lord is nudging your heart that that number that you had isn't where you want it to be. But you're saying today, I, I, I want to be I want to be ready, not worrying about what others think, but I want to be ready for the battle that we're going to face. If that's you, would you just come to the altar and join me? I won't beg or pry anyone, but if you're saying, God, I want to be ready. I want to be ready for the enemy. I want to be ready who comes after my marriage. I want to be ready, Lord God, with prayer and with, God, all the armor you've given me, the breastplate of righteousness and the shield of faith and the sword of the spirit. God, I want to be ready for the attack of the enemy in my communities oh, and at my schools. Yes, yes, God, I want to be yes, ready for yes, the attack yes, of the enemy yes, on yes, this local God, church. Yes, yes. God, I want to be ready. Yes. I want to be ready in prayer. I want to be a man of prayer, a woman of prayer. I want to be ready to love my wife, to, to, to respect my husband. I want to be ready to obey my parents in the Lord for his right. I want to be ready to go to my job and serve as unto God and not as unto man. I want to be ready to seek he first the kingdom of God. I want to be ready to stand boldly before the throne of grace on my knees calling out to God. I want to be ready that wherever God may take us as a church, that wherever God may take us as a people, I want to be ready. I want to be ready for the call he has on our lives. I want to be ready for wherever he would take us. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my My faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call. Take me deeper, take me deeper than my feet could ever walk. My faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever. Just raise your hand right where you are. Hands being raised is a sign of surrender. Saying, Lord, no longer my will but yours. And say, I want to be ready. Say, I want to be ready. Before we pray, I want you to know this. The Christian life is not a playground, but it's a battlefield. 
and God wants us to put on the whole armor of God and to be people who carry the gospel and to be prayed up and to be suited up say I want to be ready say I want to be ready let's pray father we thank you today that your word declares Lord God that we are people who know God we were far and you have brought us near by the blood of Jesus thank you Lord God for saving us thank you Lord God for reconciling us thank you Lord God for rescuing us now God we come today as a church saying we want to be ready now empower us to put on the armor of God, the blessed plate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the belt of truth, the foot of the gospel. Help us, Lord God, to march onward as Christian soldiers, marching onwards towards war. And help us, Lord God, to be prayed up. Help us to pray for our schools and pray for our children and pray for our communities and pray for our marriages and pray for those who are single and pray Lord God for our communities pray for our young men and that they will rise up to be you've called them to be pray for our young ladies pray for us God we need you Lord Jesus pray for us as a church God we want to move forward we are here Lord God knowing that your laborers are few but today we stand saying we will be ready to share the gospel to reach those who are lost to point them to Jesus and to pour our lives out to help people be fully devoted to following yes, Jesus. Yes, we thank you, Lord God. Thank you. Now start with us. Help us to be ready to put on the armor. Yes. To be suited up. To be prayed up as we go into war. Amen. For your glory Amen. and for your honor. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith would be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deep. Take me deeper than my feet could ever. Wonder, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. To keep my eyes, to keep my eyes above the My soul will rest in your embrace, for I am yours, and you are mine. Thank you, Lord. Give the Lord a clap offering of praise. Come on, love on somebody just for a little bit longer. Just love on them. Let them know that I'm praying for you. Pastor had prayed this benediction over us a couple weeks ago in this series. And I will do the same at the close of this series. Ephesians 3. And it says, for this reason... I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ 
may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, and height, and depth, and to know this love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, now, unto him, who is able to do far more abundantly than we all we can ask or think, according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Praise be to God. Give the Lord a clap offering of praise. It was great to have you here celebrate. Let's arm up and suit up in Jesus' name. Have a great week. We love you. Take care. Pray up, arm up, suit up. It's a war weary. Amen.